So Peter, we met for the first time at Lurson Live, and actually I'll put a link to Lurson Live on the video so that people can watch it. And I remember so vividly at the end of the last one that we did, somebody made a comment about when we retire, and you immediately said, retire? Who wants to retire from this business? It's a great business. Who wants to leave it? And you were born into the yacht building, shipbuilding industry? Well, my father was uh, as a workaholic as I am probably. So the shipyard was omnipresent, uh, breakfast, lunch and dinners, uh, as overriding discussion topics in the family. Um, and I think my mother endured the same misery at times as my <laughs> wife has to endure. Um, the trouble in shipbuilding is the really happy moments that you have. And there are a few of those around. You are in the office or you're traveling somewhere. Yes. But the, mis the misery gets carried home. Ah. So, you know, there's a misbalance for, uh, for the wives and for the kids. You know. But you were the kid at one point with your father yeah, doing this. Uh, my, you know, my father was much older than me and he was, he enjoyed the business. And it's a different relationship. You know, yeah. that's my, uh, I'm 62. Um, let's say you go back 50 years. My father was uh, 42 years older than me. A uh, big difference. So yeah, that's, you know, yeah. the whole thing. But shipyard was always there. And obviously that. I could never think of anything else but wanting to join the business. How many generations back does, does this go? My great great grandfather had a little boat yard on the river. And when his yeah. son, Frederick Lewison, told his father, Daddy, I want to join the business, the father said, That's fine. My boat yard only feeds one family, so start your own business. So <laughs> my great grandfather started the business that we operate today in 1875. So a bit shy of 150 years ago. Wow. But 1875, they would have been building fishing boats, maybe? No, no? come on, not such a, <laughs> a, a sophisticated boats. The first boat was literally a wooden, a rough wooden rowing boat. Wow. The big thing came, my great-grandfather then met a, met a chap called Gottlieb Daimler from Daimler-Benz. Oh. Wow. And in 1886, he built for Gottlieb Daimler the first motor boat in the world with a I think a 1.5 horsepower diesel engine, a uh, small, little bit small boat that was tested on a river in the south of Germany. And that was actually the first in the world? Yes, that was the wow. first motor boat in the world with a diesel engine, you know, it's steam engines, yeah. but diesel engines. And from then on, that dramatically changed the business. You know, motor, like, that guy was heavy into motor boats. Yeah. You know, they got bigger, they got more complex, and ultimately, uh, we were doing motorboat racing, my, my grandfather and my great-grandfather uh, right. from Maybach, for Zorro, another famous engine maker. We did, he did race a boat called Daimler, so that really changed it. Yeah. And the application of motorboats for the shipbuilding world was like uh, you know, completely new. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it it's probably was, was a more radical change than a fuel cell would be today. Yeah. to a yacht because uh, that's so um they did start also building small yachts 15 meter 20 meter right. this was big very few and then the real push into yachting came in the 20s when we were delivering a large number of yachts for the u.s uh, people used to commute them on the river down from their estates to new york city to the office yeah. that was very famous and we've done very well building a large number of those. Yeah. So, so by the time you were born, there was already a sizable company yes. with a reputation, an international reputation, actually. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, then came the, the dark times, the 30s, when we shifted from uh, civil production to military production. And then the war, and after the war, the ship that was destroyed, oh. was rebuilt. And that's when we built the first fishing boat. Oh, really? The first boat we built was a fishing vessel, which we actually operated ourselves, and the workers were paid in kind with fresh fish, which, you know, yeah. the times were very bad, and, uh, and, and food was a scarce commodity, so that was very helpful. They then built a small freighter with two engines, because they couldn't get in one engine that's big enough to drive it, so they used 
two engines from a patrol boat side by side really? to drive the boat. And it really started getting into the market when it was, uh, was a contract for the Swedish Navy. We built 12 boats for the Swedish Navy. High tensile steel, very fast. And we built those even before Germany was allowed to rearm, which they did in 56, yeah. joint NATO and all that. And that's when we started going back to the production of fast patrol boats in parallel to doing uh, small cargo ships. So 56, that's round about the time that you were born then? 59. Uh, 59. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the context that you were born into. And did you used to go to the shipyard a lot as a kid or did your father kind of keep you away from no, it? No, we used to play in the shipyard. Did you? And the shipyard was five minutes to walk from where I grew up. Right. And a shipyard is an exciting place for kids. Yeah. Come on, you know, what is now our office building or one of the office buildings? Yeah. We had the heavy machinery in the bay, in the lowest floor, the lace and the, the drilling machines. And then were the, um, the carpenters, the paint shop. And on the, on, the, on the second floor was electricians and only on the top floor, a tiny little office. Uh, and this only got changed in the late 70s when we moved the complete production over to across the river to Lower Saxony, Lemwerda. Yeah. Until then, the ships were launched in Lemwerda, were pulled over to Fegesack for the final outfitting. Yeah. So I, you know, we were playing around. Uh, it's exciting, you know, even hide and seek in the building. Yes. Uh, it's like great fun. So I've always mm -hmm. been, been there, and when I was six and a half, a classmate of mine's father was a driving teacher yes. who knew my parents. So the deal was we could drive in the shipyard and he would teach us. So Fantastic. by seven o'clock, his son and me were sitting in a car with two cushions, just barely <laughs> getting over the wheel, <laughs> racing every Sunday from about 10 to 12 in the shipyard. We'd be driving the security nuts yeah. and doing all kinds of stunts. But was ship that was our life, That's as fantastic. it is today. But I'm really curious when I hear stories like this, um, because you've obviously got such a big passion for what you do, but there must have been a, a transition from when you were the boss's son to when you became the boss. So how, how was that handled? Did you, yeah, how, how did you transition in that way? Well, put it this way, unfortunately my father passed away in 81. I just started my studies to become a naval architect. Right. And then for the rest of my education, you know, there was nobody in the ship, but we had a guy that was working in our Malaysian shipyard to step in, he's a great guy, I worked for him in Malaysia for four months in our shipyard there, which was a great time in 1980. Um, so yes, I was the boss's son, but it was my uncle and my father, like the, you yes. know, like the, the whiskey drinking brothers, it's now the yeah. water drinking cousins, <laughs> to say life is getting bored. Um, so there wasn't really a period at which I was the boss's son there, because right. my father wasn't there anymore. And I joined in 87 after I finished an MBA in the States. The thing was that you, know, you do half a year uh, trying to understand the shipyard. I was yes. working on and off before, but I remember I was, I, my goal was to be there one hour ahead of work start in the morning. So I was yeah. in the production every morning at six instead of seven walked around the shipyard and then chatted with all the department heads and production guy. And when they were finishing up, I would move from the production side to the office side and do something else there. So right. um, it's actually uh, a bit of, um, of a drag to say. <laughs> and the idea was that because I'm a naval architect, they said, great, we're going to make you the head of production and then we're going to make a technical director. And I was destined for that job and I uh, very quickly I realized that my brain is wired in a different way. Yep. To be head of production and technical guy you need to be a different character than me. Um, I told this to my cousin, I said look you know good plan doesn't work. Yep. And then we did something else and this was like beginning of 88 and 88 in May we had a seminar in those days it was all about diversification. All right. So we had this famous trumpet model. You go for the worst case, for the best case, and if you prepare for both, 
extremes, yes. you know, everything in between should work. Yes. I remember we had a guy who was always been like the negative guy, and he said in May 88, the Warsaw Pact will disassemble, the wall's going to break down, and there'll be universal peace. And even the, the guy who was like orchestrating the, the trumpet, Yes. said, come on, we want to stay realistic. It was May <laughs> 88 and, really? the, and, the, and the wall opened up in the fall of 89. It was My quite, word. It yeah. was like, and nobody was realized. We weren't prepared for that, put it no, this way. No. And, the, and the options on the table where we were looking at it at, at a big team, we were like 35 people, all the top guys in the company. And we, we had 95% military. So we said, we need to do something else. Yeah. And the options yeah. was aluminum fast ferries, Yep. as was done in Norway, very successful yep. in those days, or yours. And um, I was very lucky, one of the many lucky moments in my life, uh, that we choose yours and not fast ferries. <laughs> yes. I mean, fast ferries are, are gone, yep. the type of fast ferries, and it was not a sensible venture. It was done by very small shipyards, yep. and uh, it wouldn't work. And, and yours turned out to be uh, the better end of the it's thing, not gone say. too badly has it <laughs> yeah, it's not gone too badly it's um again you know we've been i set up a team yeah. and asking about from the boss to the boss's son to the boss nobody needs the next generation in the business because we good well-run business all positions are taken care of right. so that everybody was happy that i got a new field to play yeah. with so to say and don't mess up the normal uh, organization, <laughs> which is difficult. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, I got a team together and um, with my cousin's help, we managed to sell a 40 meter yacht B mine, which was tough because yes. the guy then defaulted on his payments. We had to repossess it. Um, well, it was okay. And then, you know, again, very fortunate, we met some very, very good clients and very quickly came from a 40 meter uh, then was coral ocean coral right Island, yes in which we contracted in 91 it's very quick yes um and you know i'm still in touch with the client i built multiple boats for him from that came limitless yes where we only had a chance that that client had a fed ship and you know, those days fed ship was Yep. Number one. I wasn't yeah. even a doubt, not even a shroud of doubt yes. that this is the mark you want to try to come close to. Yeah. And we only had a chance because the client left Corinthia six. Right. And went to John Bunnenberg and said to John, I want a modern version, but it has to be Corinthia. Yeah. And every yeah. attempt of John to change it, he just was shot down right away and he said, No, this is because of us having built Corinthia. He came and talked to us, and in the end, we built Limitless. It was 96 meters. And then we had this fantastic contract for an Asian client that didn't get finished, but was a big venture. And then, you know, the big boat market came, and we've really been lucky. Yeah, and well, uh, lucky, but obviously consistent with the quality and the, the timing of delivery. I mean, as you know, I've worked for a shipyard. It's, <laughs> There's not a lot of luck. It's a lot of hard work and good planning, I think, to... Teamwork. To, teamwork. Yeah. It's, it's, a shipyard is a very complicated machine. And if one little piece of the machine doesn't work right, yeah. it stops. Um, and that, I think, is, is the, the area that, that we really try, have tried hard and we are continuously trying to improve is the coordination and the management of making this machine work in a perfectly synchronized way. Yeah. Now we've done two lives and lives together. The first one was about size matters, which wanted to really emphasize that owners shouldn't just think of Larson for 150, 160 meter yachts, but also for 50, 60 meter yachts. We have built more yachts under 90 than above 90. Than and above I can 90. say that in the last seven, eight months, we've been very successful in the range 70 to 80 meter. Good. Good. So yeah. people tend to forget that because obviously a 100 meter plus creates more media attention yes. than an 80 meter, but that is an important part of our business and always will be. Yeah. And the second lesson live that we did, um, 
which was so interesting, really explored fuel cell technology. Now, I know that you firmly believe that's the future of yachting. How, how are things progressing with, with that? The, um, the, the installation is now running, uh, the test installation. Um, our partner in that venture has just, uh, is, is also working with Meyerwerf. They're going to install one on one of the cruise ships. Uh, not a big one, but at least a few cells. It will give us a lot of practical data, which is important. And we on track for the installation of the fuel cell on that uh, ship we built in Rendsburg. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's, it's astonishing from like, uh, effectively a little boy in the shipyard <laughs> sitting on cushions to drive a car around. <laughs> and you've gone from your great grandfather building the first ever yacht with a combustion engine to possibly you building the first one without a combustion engine. Well, that's clearly the aim. I think we all are critically aware of the climate situation. Yeah. I'm clearly aware, and I'm sure the whole industry is aware that how critical, the, how important the ocean is for the CO2 balance. Very few people understand that the carbon absorption capability of the ocean is dramatic and we need to keep the oceans healthy to maintain that carbon absorption because without it there's no way even if you stop everything you're not going to be able to survive on this no. earth so this is important and we all we all do our what we can to make sure that the yachting is becoming more sustainable than it is. Yeah. You can always criticize it, but yachting has been, I think, a great facilitator for inventions because we never used heavy fuel oil. You yeah. see all these ugly pictures of cruise ships and the yeah. black plumes, and we all know the sad story of Venice when the air quality yeah. is really bad. Yachts never done that. Yeah. We use uh, clean diesel fuel. We always lose, used uh, low sulfur diesel fuel. Um, we use, uh, you know, we, we try to save uh, on energy consumption everywhere we can. So yeah. this is a big thing. And um, yes, I would love to be the first to build a 100% uh, fuel cell yacht uh, in the future. Yeah. And just a, a final question, just to give you an opportunity to respond to the critics who will say, oh, well, they shouldn't be building yachts at all. If you want a clean planet, we shouldn't have yachts. How would you answer, how would you answer that? If you go down that kind of, uh, of thinking, I would say, look, we know what the, what is, who is causing what kind of emission. And that is, yachting is a small fraction. And yes. yes, we are working very hard to even reduce that small fraction. Yes. But I think we should always start where you get the best return. There are other things where I believe the yachting industry and the yachting owners can do much more to compensate for whatever mission we have. Bottom fishing, the people that drag the net over the ground, that releases an amazing amount of CO2. And if we stop that, we reduce the emission of CO2 into the air tremendously. If we manage to have a healthy uh, population of fish in the ocean, that is a huge thing. Uh, seagrass and the mangroves capturing more CO2 than all the rainforest. The absorption rate is faster, it's more efficient. So we need to protect seagrass. In the 1920s, people on the coast were chopping the seagrass because it doesn't feel nice when you go swimming. Now the French actually limit anchoring for ships over 24 meters to protect the seagrass. So this is very important. Last night I was at a, at a dinner for Blue Marine Foundation and we raised, if all goes well, almost a million for projects to create marine reserves, marine parks. This will then 
create an enormous absorption of CO2. I mean, a not so nice topic over dinner, but the fish eat plankton on the top, and when it's, when it's digested, it sinks to the ground. That is a huge a storage of CO2 and all these things. So the yachting industry is doing a lot, and I'm happy to say that two of my colleagues have been there, and they've been very generously helping the cause. And I think we should do it positively. We should use the impact these people can have and turn it into something positive with a much wider Im implication, a much more positive impact than the exhaust area. And we are reducing it through things like fuel cell technology. Mm -hmm.